Well, hello, everybody, and uh, welcome to SLU, your interface to outer space. I'm your host and expedition leader, Jerry Muldeur, and tonight is all about the Milky Way. It's our home galaxy, of course, and it's also one of the most beautiful and breathtaking features of our night sky. If you've never seen it, it might be because you live in an area of the world plagued by light pollution. We're going to be talking an awful lot about that tonight. And you don't need very much light pollution to cause trouble. Even just a street light can cause the, the bright stars in the sky to look dim or to disappear entirely. Now that's why our SLU observatories are situated in a protected dark sky area in the Canary Islands. And we've brought together a number of feed partners tonight who are also bringing us live images of their local dark skies and the stars above. And here to talk about what we're looking at, why it's so interesting and important is SLU astronomer and our friend Paul Cox, who is at our Canary Islands Observatory right now. Paul, good to see you again. Working hard as always. What do you have for us tonight? Well, nothing more than our own cosmic backyard. We got some fabulous feeds set up tonight and starting with this one, Jerry, look at this. This is our all sky camera, special low light camera that looks at the entire sky here above the observatory. And there we can see what we're hoping to see tonight, the Milky Way stretching up that band that frankly looks like cloud in this fabulous image, Jerry. Yeah, Paul, I got to admit, the first time I ever went out and tried to photograph the Milky Way, uh, it's part of what I do for a living, uh, I, I really wasn't aware of what I was looking at because I thought it was clouds. It looks gaseous, yeah. doesn't it? It, it does. And, I, and I, I think I said to you once before that I remember the first time I ever came to this observatory, which is the first time I'd ever been to a, an international dark sky site. And I set up to do all of my work that evening. I was gonna do a focus calibration or something like that with one of the telescopes. And then I looked up after I'd set up and I thought, no, it's cloudy. And I started packing up to go in and it was the Milky Way. It was, right. it's just so strong here. It's absolutely remarkable. You really have to experience a, a dark sky site, a true dark sight sky a bit, bit, to, to really experience it. You know, it's, it's absolutely remarkable. Yep, and you happen to be sitting in one of the best in the world. I am. Uh, this is the third best uh, astronomical observatory site in the world. Hawaii and Atacama in uh, the Atacama Desert in Chile and Hawaii, they kind of box it out for first place. But there's an awful lot of things going against those two sites. Uh, but would you believe, Jerry, the largest optical telescope in the world is based right here in the Canary Islands, not in Hawaii, not in the Atacama Desert. No, those people chose to put that enormous piece of glass, that very expensive piece of glass on the neighboring island of La Palma. Hey, look at this, Jerry. This is from our all sky uh, camera tonight. So this is taking an image every minute. And just on to the, just to the left of you, we can see that zodiacal light, which we spoke about in a previous right. show, but there right. at this time of year, Oh, there is wow. the Milky Way rising up into the sky. And it's a great time of year to start to see the Milky Way rising. Uh, Paul, we have feed partners tonight. Yes, we do. We are waiting for uh, some images to come in from South Africa, our feed partner down there, and Versfeld, waiting for those to come in. But Keith Kobe from Dubai, uh, Keith has got some great images coming in. They go out into the desert. And, you know, you, you, you look at images of Dubai and it's so glitz. There's so many lights there. There's so much light pollution. You probably can't even see the moon if you're in the city. But step outside 20, 30 miles outside of the city itself and you just get these pristine dark skies. And because of the time zone there, Jerry, we specifically asked Keith uh, to do this in Dubai because the Milky Way has risen even further in Dubai. So it's standing as an enormous kind of column coming up from the horizon, the southern horizon. So we're going to see some live images coming from there as well. In fact, there it is. There wow, it is, right? look wow. at <laughs> that. And that really is cool. And, and there it is. I mean, we're looking at our galaxy. It doesn't look like a galaxy, not like the images that we see through the other slew telescopes. 
of other galaxies, but that's exactly what it is. And what we're seeing there actually is the very centre of our galaxy, the Milky Way as well, Jerry. You know, it, it really, when you see the Milky Way, Paul, it, it really drives home just how enormous this galaxy is. I mean, we are looking at the galaxy that we are in, and it looks it, like that. It, it, exactly. And what we're seeing actually is a lot of dust there. What looks like a dark lane there is actually hiding the the millions and millions of stars. In fact, there's billions. There's about 200 billion stars in our Milky Way galaxy. And that dust lane is actually hiding everything behind it. So we don't even actually get to see the majority of the stars. But look at this image as well, coming in from France. We've got a few feeds coming in from France. And once again, they're just slightly east of us here in the Canary Islands as well. So that's rising a little bit higher as well. That looks great, doesn't it? Yeah, it's just, just uh, astounding, astounding. So uh, once again, Paul, the Milky Way is called the Milky Way because of basically the way it looks to uh, the naked eye. Yeah, I mean, it was, um, I think it was the Egyptians, first of all, they kind of saw it as a pathway to the afterlife. But like so many things in astronomy and in the night sky, it kind of comes from Latin, it comes from Greek uh, about uh, Gala Galaxus Kilos uh, or Galakos, uh, which kind of means milk. And they thought it looked like a, a milky circle going across the sky. And the name has stuck. So there it is. And by the way, uh, if you see photographs uh, of the Milky Way, it's really up to the, the photographer who took the pictures to use his, uh, in, to interpret it the way he wants. I mean, let's face it, the Milky Way just doesn't look very uh, colorful. So oftentimes you'll see, you'll see pictures, you'll see photographs that have been enhanced slightly. So don't, don't think that the Milky Way looks like the, uh, the way it does in a lot of photographs, Paul. Well, actually, if we go to our all sky camera again, that gives a fairly true rendition of what it looks like. This is what I do there is I set the color saturation on that particular camera um, to show white stars as being white. And that's how you know whether or not a photograph has been oversaturated or had the color tweaked. You can see here the background of the image is actually quite light, uh, but that's just to draw more stars out. I'm looking up above me and the sky is pitch black here, but I get to see the Milky Way just like that. And it's usually in those kind of soft brown tones. That's, that's, that's what you really get from a true dark sky sight. You can start seeing those tones come out. Well, it's just gorgeous as always. Hey, Paul, sit back, relax, and enjoy the, uh, the show above you. Uh, we'll take a break, and uh, I know you'll be rejoining us in just a bit to talk more about the observatory in the Canary Islands. So hang okay. in there. Th thanks so much. Paul will be back, but uh, before we talk to him again, we'll have a group of fascinating guests all joining us to give their own perspective on the night sky and the importance of protecting it. Now, coming up, we'll be speaking to Athena Brensberger, an amateur astronomer and science communicator and model and dancer, yes, who will talk about looking up at the sky from a big city like New York. We'll also be joined by award-winning astrophotographer Julie Fletcher, who's on location in Australia. And she'll be talking about how dark skies affect her work, and that's pretty obvious. And Jim Bradburn, president of Dark Skies of the Wet Mountain Valley in Colorado, will be here to talk about why his organization fights to protect their own skies and how being able to see the stars really changes your perspective on the universe. That's all coming up in just a couple of minutes, so don't go anywhere.
We've been all over the world chasing solar eclipses to share with you. This time, you're coming with us. Join SLU as we expedition to Stanley, Idaho to celebrate the transcontinental eclipse on August 21st. Sign up today at slu.com. Space is limited. Hey there, and welcome back to our live show. We're celebrating dark skies while we gaze at the Milky Way. And there's a shot from our all-sky camera in the Canary Islands Observatory. You can see just uh, a stunning shot of, of the Milky Way. I'm your host, Jerry. We're all attracted to space for different reasons, and we come to it in different ways and from different backgrounds. Amateur astronomers and science communicators work to try to attract more to space science, and our next guest is both. She's here to tell us how dark skies and light pollution affect her. Athena, welcome aboard. Thanks so much for, for joining us. You have uh, quite a resume, uh, young lady. How did, you, how did you first get interested in astronomy? Uh, I was actually 12 years old. My best friend Anika gave me a book that was on the cosmos, and I thought they were all paintings. And I was like, wow, these are really great paintings, like pictures of stuff. And then she told me, no, these are actual things, like beyond our stars, just things called nebulae and like galaxies, and we're in a galaxy. And that day I was like, oh my gosh, I need to do something with my life that involves uh, something in astronomy and astrophysics. That's kind of how I got first got into it. <laughs> Okay, and, and now what do you do with it? Yeah, so now, uh, well, I was conducting research uh, back in college. Um, I was at the College of Staten Island, but I was um, at the Hayden Planetarium under a couple space grants, and one of them was through NASA. And that led me down um, a path of wanting to go more into the science communicator route. Um, I've been in show business for quite a few years, and I've always loved trying to dissect things, really complicated things, and exploring, explaining that to people. So I started a blog, um, and no, a blog, I guess, blog, blog, blog type of thing. And I just started um, explaining things of how my first professors used to explain stuff. And so now I actually start to go give talks. Um, I have been to NASA for a few different things. So I try to do like media coverage. I write articles and, and stuff like that. But I try to really get as much of an outreach as I can to uh, people that aren't so familiar with um, like the vocabulary of astronomy and astrophysics, get them interested. Because everyone is kind of into uh, space, but I try to make it a little more understanding through a lot of my videos that I do. And I got to say to the folks at home, you're, you're doing this, you're educating people, especially young people, mentoring them uh, when you're not modeling, acting, dancing, correct? <laughs> yeah, that, that is uh, correct. Actually, in about a week, um, a bunch of the new uh, research, uh, RU students, research experience from the graduates are going to be arriving to the Hayden Planetarium. And uh, one of my old mentors, uh, Dr. Charles Liu, asked me to come in and give a talk. So I do do that. Um, and at the same time, it's actually during market week. So I'll be doing some modeling too <laughs> on the side and stuff like that. But yeah, that's actually why um, I kind of di diverted out of um, my research at the time was I got scouted in New York and ended up 
thankfully being able to travel the world through uh, my modeling career. And actually, that was the first time I really saw stars. I mean, I was in the Philippines and I looked up and I was like, wow, like first mm -hmm. time I saw more stars than, I mean, obviously New York City, but it was it was amazing. So I try and balance out both because a lot of people, uh, especially into astronomy, are also into the arts. I mean, my mentor himself was um, a musical theater performer and an amazing pianist and at the same time was in astrophysics. And Neil deGrasse Tyson, who was one of my other, uh, became an advisor of mine, um, but he was a competitive dancer. And so he helped yeah. actually aid me in my direction of testing out kind of the I guess the land of the performing arts and still do astronomy and stuff. Sure, yeah. sure. Cool. Well, well you, you you mentioned stargazing. Is it possible to do it? I mean, you're, right now you're in Brooklyn, right? Is it possible yes. on a clear night to see stars in Brooklyn? Yeah, you definitely can, especially with uh, kind of like a mediocre telescope. I have one behind me. Um, it's just like a 50 magnitude. Uh, but you could still see, uh, you could see like the craters on the moon um, and you can see uh, Venus. Uh, you could definitely see Jupiter. Um, I go to Columbia Outreach a lot of times, Astronomy Outreach on uh, Columbia University. On the roof, they have really cool telescopes where you can actually see like the rings of Saturn. You could see quite a lot of stars. Orion's belt is beautiful. Um, on some nights, you could actually see the Orion Nebula, the little blob underneath the three stars of the belt. So you could see some, but it's, it's quite difficult. You have to go to a park. Sure, sure. Well, when you're when you're out there trying to see stars in uh, in uh, Brooklyn or any part of, of New York, do you think about light pollution? Does it does it bother you? Oh yeah, all the time. Um, because first of all, you have to kind of block it with your hand anyway. Like what I learned from one of my teachers back in um, in high school, uh, we had an observatory, but. Um, you always are going to have to try and block it out. So it does bother me um, because even with binoculars, uh, it's still a lot of the light pollution is still being reflected on the, the lower atmosphere. So a lot of times it's, it, you could still, uh, you're still being blocked from a lot of the stars. So of course, it, I mean, it does bother me because I want to show people more stuff of how amazing it is. But I think that obviously, you know, you live in any big city, it's going to happen. Um, Thankfully, we do have a lot of these areas like Canary Islands where it is a dark sky um, observing area. Uh, it's, it's wonderful. Uh, I'm glad that these places still exist. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. So do you find it difficult when you're talking to, say, a group of kids and you, and you say, you know what? It, trust me, up there is the Milky Way. You can't see it because we're in Brooklyn, but trust me, it's up there. Does that, does that ever happen? Yeah, it does. Um, I mean, I'd have to obviously show them pictures. Um, a lot of right. times I do use uh, like the NASA Eyes software um, that they have uh, for the computer. And if I'm doing like a planetarium talk or I'm doing some type of demonstration, you could see um, like parts. I mean, at least you could kind of see what's going on. So it's, it's graphics. It's not in real life. So for kids, yeah, I mean, they, they want to see the real thing. And, um, you know, they get to see the moon and they do see some stars. But I remember when I was little... Um, if I would be in a park at night or something, um, like, I don't know if it's like the 4th of July and everyone's gathering together before the fireworks go off, you could see more than 10 stars and it's amazing. So it does make a huge impact on kids um, when there is light pollution because they, they, you know, their, their curiosity is kind of being blocked. There's a filter there. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I uh, encourage everybody and encourage you to tell people to tune into SLU because this, I mean, look at that. Here's a, here's a shot from one of our uh, observatories in Chile, and you oh. can see the, the, uh, the Milky Way on the, on the bottom part of your screen. It's just, it's just phenomenal. Okay, uh, you know what time it is, Athena? Uh, what time is it? <laughs> it's 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 plug time for you. So go ahead. Plug I know time. I was I was oh. on your web I was on your website today, and it's enormous. <laughs> Well, thank you. Um, yeah, so if anyone wanted to look up any of my stuff, uh, my name is Astro Athens, all one word. Um, it's pretty universal, so it's my website, astroathens.com, um, and all my social media tags, uh, YouTube, Instagram, everything, it's Astro Athens. Um, so on there, I have like all my stuff. I just started this new fun thing called Astro Minute because Instagram limits you to doing 60-second videos, so I try to explain complex theories in 60 seconds in a really easy way. I usually just use a cup of coffee and a napkin. But anyway, my name is uh, Astro Athens everywhere if you guys want to look at any of my stuff. <laughs> All right, yeah. very cool. Uh, Athena, go out, find some dark sky and check out the Milky Way. And we hope to have you back again. 
Yes, definitely. I totally want to, especially with some of these images. They look great. Thank you so much for having me. <laughs> awesome. Really appreciate it. All right. Coming up for some people, stargazing isn't just a hobby, it's a profession. Like award-winning astrophotographer Julie Fletcher, who will be joining us on location in South Australia to talk about how dark skies help her take breathtaking photographs. You won't believe how beautiful they are. Stay with us. Give the gift of the universe. Give the gift of SLU. A celebration of every magical moment in the night sky. For just $60, you can give the budding space explorer in your life the gift of a full year of SLU membership. It's available now at slu.com. And 
and welcome back to our live show here on SLU as we gaze at the Milky Way from around the world. There's a view from our all sky camera in the Canary Islands in Spain. Just another magnificent look at the Milky Way. I'm your host, Jerry Monteux. Tonight, we've been talking about the importance of dark skies to the way we view, literally view, the universe, our galaxy in particular. For some people, though, it's, it's not just about thought. For astronomers and folks like our next guest, it's also about livelihood. Julie Fletcher is an award-winning astrophotographer from Australia. She's here to tell us all about how dark skies help her take gorgeous photos. Uh, Julie, thanks for joining us. Really appreciate it. Uh, question number one is, when did you get into astrophotography? I, I, I just assumed that you were a, a photographer first and then wound up doing astrophotography. Is that correct? Yeah, that, that is correct, Jerry. Uh, probably I've been doing it a few years now. I've been a photographer for probably about 15 years, professional uh, landscape photographer. And I got into astrophotography probably three or four years ago. And uh, yeah, just um, in, really enjoy, I guess, the, the night sky and just um, seeing amazing things happen and, and uh, just the challenge of it all, yeah. I uh, dabble in uh, astrophotography too. And what I found, Julie, is it really is the ultimate combination of composition, uh, technique, talent, and you also, you really need something in the foreground. I mean, let's, let's face it, you can take a picture of the Milky Way, anybody can do it with a DSLR, but to have it yeah. be a, 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 a something that, that people are going to really appreciate, there must be something in the foreground, correct? Yes, definitely. It's um, the same rules apply as with general, I guess, landscape photography, uh, composition, you know, light and composition, or in this case, dark and composition. But um, with a lot of my images, I tend to, I guess, uh, put light in to, to add light. I either will use moonlight, depending on the phase I'm working with. Moon, the moon uh, is really, really handy and throws a beautiful even light over, over a scene. And if it's not too bright, then you will still see uh, all the constellations and, and the Milky Way and whatever you're trying to photograph in the night sky as well. Otherwise, I'll, I'll use torches. And mm -hmm. uh, last night, I was actually up on uh, what's called Mount Olsen here in the Flinders Ranges, where I currently am photographing, and I'm doing a lot of astro work up here at the moment. And I was up there at 3 a.m. this morning uh, photographing yeah. what we call grass trees over here. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was using... Uh, flash. I was actually incorporating fill flash in my night images. I can't actually show you what I was doing because I haven't haven't actually downloaded any of the shots yet. But um, they will be on my social media in the next few days to a week. If anyone's interested in having a look, I understand. And by the way, uh, you worked until what time this morning? Uh, I got up at two a.m. And I got out of bed at, oh, I was struggling, 2.30. And then I was, uh, I was on the trail. It takes an hour and a half to, to walk up with my gear because I've got a heavy backpack. So about an hour and a half up. So um, I left at about 10 to 3 this morning. Yeah. And I got up at, yeah, 4.30 or whatever it was just after. <laughs> well, uh, that's the that's the other untold story is that anybody who's into astrophotography is on a vampire schedule. And so yeah. we can't we we can't thank you enough for doing this. This is uh, really, really good of you. Um, so in, in addition to astrophotography, what are your favorite things to photograph? Uh, I, I specialize in landscape. So um, I guess the outback is is my specialized area. I live in the outback. So hence, it just goes hand in hand. And um, I'm not a real big city person anyway, haven't been for a very long time. So I tend to be drawn to remote locations. So um, a lot of my body of work is, is from more remote areas. Like if anyone knows Australia, uh, the Flinders Ranges is where I am right now. It, it's not that remote in the big scheme of things, but it's, um, you know, yet clear skies because 
we're far, far away from cities and towns out here. We've just got a little resort and the closest town is Hawker, which is only a small town anyway. And mm-hmm. where I live is, is miles away. So uh, I'm very remote and I, I do a lot of travelling up and down uh, remote tracks and roads. And, um, yeah, I just love it. So I get a lot of clear skies out, out where I am. So it's, it's great for astrophotography. Yeah, so very little light pollution where you are. And uh, yep. a, a, fu- a funny little story, Julie, is that the first time I went out to try to shoot the Milky Way, I mean, I had everything lined up. I had all the gear I needed. It was a beautiful, clear night, absolutely no light pollution, except I forgot to check the phase of the moon, and it absolutely killed me. <laughs> yeah, that'll that'll do it. <laughs> <laughs> we'll do it for sure. Now, it, it's, it's, a, it's amazing how, how little light is necessary to to ruin a Milky Way shot. Yeah, you can work with the moon up until about half when it's about at 50% and that's pushing the boundaries generally. You can get away with it depending on what, you, what you're doing. But after that, yeah, uh, it's just too bright and it kills off yeah. all the stars. Yeah, I was so bummed. And... <laughs> We're, I, I, I'm just going to assume that you're like everybody else. The first time you were out there under a, uh, an incredibly dark sky, looking up at the vastness of the universe, um, do you remember how you felt? Because I do. I, 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 I felt like, like my life had absolutely changed, and I was, uh, in, in many ways, so small and worthless. When I looked up and, and my eyes were, finally got used to the darkness, and I could see, I don't know how many... 10,000 stars. Did, did that affect you the same way? Well, it does. It does every time I, I look up into the sky because, but you have to understand because of where I live, I see that all the time. So mm-hmm. it's, it's, it's just by and by every day or every night, apart from when obviously the moon's up, um, we have beautiful clear skies, not a lot of clouds where I live either. And it's a very dry region, like an arid um, desert region so the, the nights um, the days and the nights are normally just clear so the stars shine shine super bright and yeah just um, a couple of nights ago when I was talking to somebody out the front of, of my house where I live and I said to my friend Jenny I said just check out this sky with you it's it just looks amazing tonight so yeah and I, I never get sick of it it's it's just awesome and every time you're in a different location there's always something different going on in the sky. Like I see some crazy stuff. Like I saw some the biggest shooting star not that long ago and I've never seen anything like it before that or since. It was just like a rocket going across the sky. And unfortunately my camera was facing in the opposite direction so I was oh. a bit bummed about that. But it was just awesome. It lit the sky up. I looked around over my shoulder because it got my attention and I thought, holy moly. And it just lasted for ages, what seemed like a minute, but it's probably more like 10 seconds. But right. um, it just shot shot across the sky and it just kept going and going and going. I'm thinking, wow, this is – nobody nobody sees this stuff except me. Yeah, yeah, it is uh, It is amazing. And b- before we let you go, the, the shot with the camels in the foreground, okay, you know, it's mm-hmm. what I'm talking about. How did you get those camels to stay still for 25, 30 seconds? That's the one. <laughs> pure, pure, what can I say this? Pure ass. Oh. Australian, ex- it's a, an Australian expression. It means it was just luck. That's all it was. <laughs> oh. and, and it was, it wasn't, it wasn't a long exposure. That was, um twilight so it was it was getting dark but there was still plenty of of uh available light in the sky so yeah. i just upped the iso as as hard as i could go and i was on 2.8 aperture yeah. and um just tried to keep the shutter the shutter speed down or as fast as i possibly could for for that shot but they were they were curious they didn't uh-huh. know who i was or what i was so there were moments when they were just like dead still and just I guess trying to listen for what what I was doing so uh yeah it was just luck well don't don't ever admit that okay don't ever admit it was just luck it was you planned it that way hey Julie 
Uh, we can't thank you enough uh, for, for joining us. And uh, again, I know uh, what kind of a schedule you're on now, so much appreciated. That's all right. No problem. All right. Take care. Enjoy your stuff. Really, it's awesome. All right. Coming up, light pollution. Well, there's not much of it in the Canary Islands, and that's why Paul Cox and our telescopes are there. We'll be back with more from Paul in a moment. We've been all over the world chasing solar eclipses to share with you. This time, you're coming with us. Join SLU as we expedition to Stanley, Idaho to celebrate the transcontinental eclipse on August 21st. Sign up today at slu.com. Space is limited.
and welcome back to our live show as we gaze at the Milky Way and contemplate the universe. There's a shot uh, from our all sky camera in the Canary Islands. We, we, we've we been talking about the importance of dark skies to the way we think about the skies. And someone who's getting an up close view right now is our friend and SLU astronomer Paul Cox, who is in the Canary Islands at our observatory right now. Paul, welcome back. As we look at the Milky Way itself, for the for those who don't know, I mean, really, it looks cloudy, but it, I, I guess in a way you could say it is. It's kind of gaseous and you can't really see through it, but what if we could, man? Wow. Mm -hmm. image it's pretty difficult to tell kind of that we're in a galaxy so really if we want to see outside of that we really have to look at other galaxies and don't forget Jerry you know it's only since 1920 that we really understood that we were in only one of many, many galaxies. And that was Edwin Hubble that chose all of that. But we've got some images here that we took with the half meter telescope here, which is just next to me. This was actually, oh yeah, oh, this is one of my favorites. I love this. <laughs> this was taken with the half meter telescope literally 15 minutes ago. We were hoping to show it live during the show, but this is what SLU members get to see live every night one of my favorite galaxies, the Whirlpool Galaxy. Now, if you ignore the little thing on the top, which is actually another galaxy which it's interacting with, our galaxy, the Milky Way, doesn't look much different to that huge spiraling thing, right? But we're in it. So if you were looking at that, in fact, let's have a look at, um, I think we've got another one which is more representative of our galaxy, the Pinwheel Galaxy, if we can call that up. And if you can imagine, oh, look at this. This is from Peter Eilas, one of the SLU members, and he generated this image uh, from some of the data that he collected live using the, uh, the Canary 2 uh, 17-inch telescope. Now, if we were able to shoot outside of our own Milky Way galaxy and look down on it, it would look roughly like this. And where we are, where our sun is, it's kind of in one of those outer arms down at the bottom, Jerry. And we're actually in a fairly, we're kind of in the, the countryside, if you like, of the, <laughs> uh, of the Milky Way. The galactic core, that center, that's where all the action's going. That's where the supermassive black hole is. That's where the stars are whizzing around that black hole before they're absolutely devoured by it. But as you can see, if you can imagine, if you were inside that flat disk, because that's what we're looking at. That spiral is flat. We've got another uh, image of a galaxy where we're seeing it side on. This is the edge on galaxy. And it too 
is a spiral galaxy, but from our location, this is how we sit. That is a spiral galaxy, but this gives us a better idea of what our own Milky Way galaxy is like as we're seeing it tonight in our all sky camera. So imagine zooming in, zooming in, zooming in. That's what we're seeing. And we're, oh, look at that studio, hot tonight. Um, <laughs> that, that bulge, we see the bulge of our own Milky Way galaxy, this huge halo of stars in the center of it. And there you can see in this other galaxy, there are these huge dust lanes and star forming regions as well. So, you know, it's pretty cool to be able to see these other galaxies using the SLU telescopes. And it kind of gives us a better perspective on where we live, our particular corner of the cosmos, if you like. Yeah, yeah, we uh, we actually live in the uh, Milky Way suburbs, if you will. Uh, we do, yeah. yeah. So in the Orion so Spur, would you know? It's between uh, the Perseus and Sagittarius arms. So those are the two arms, and we're kind of in this kind of lull in between, this kind of backwater in between, which is called the Orion Spur, which is quite cool. Yeah, it is cool, and it's it's also phenomenal to uh, look at the Milky Way and realize we are in it. This is, exactly. you know, we're, we're looking at something that we're actually in. So uh, we talked about this earlier, Paul. One of the reasons, one of the big reasons we chose the Canary Islands for our uh, observatory there is because of the dark skies. Is there a way to quantify or describe just how dark those skies are? There are, and there are little light meters, actually, that, uh, that we were hoping to have a, a guest on from one of the dark sky associations tonight. And a lot of those associations have handed out and kind of they've gone on a, a little bit of a, a ride around amateur astronomers around the world where they can actually measure their sky brightness. And they have to do it at the same phase of the moon and stuff like that. So they get comparable measurements. But it is astonishing just how light polluted our skies are. I mean, the fact that our, our guest tonight, Athena, said that she's never seen the Milky Way. I mean, that's criminal that people <laughs> don't get to see these things in our sky. I mean, when I look up now, I've got Jupiter, which is setting over in the on the western horizon. I've got Saturn in front of me. It's actually the very bright star, uh, a reddish looking star, which is above the yellow bar in the center of our image there. Those probably as well as the moon and maybe Venus in the evening or in the morning are probably the only stars that people in the city get to see. You know, you really can probably only pick out the Orion, um, the constellation of Orion from any city. Um, but, you know, even in the suburbs now, you know, with these security lights and this really poor design of, of lights, um, you know, as you were saying before, it doesn't take very much to just totally ruin the night skies. Um, and, and, you know, it, it is criminal that our kids don't get to see us. This is what inspires me. You know, you look at this stuff and you gaze up. You said, Jerry, that when you first saw it, you felt worthless. When I'm here, I feel the total opposite. I feel, I feel very fortunate and I feel very special to be a sentient being who can actually gaze up at this thing. And I'll tell you, when you're here, I, every time I leave, uh, I finish the night, I go down, I lie on the bonnet of my car, and I just spend 15 or 20 minutes just gazing up. And it's three-dimensional. Mm. And the fact that, you know, you know we, we think there's life just about everywhere throughout this galaxy. You know, for, for all of those stars that we're seeing in this image, we now think most of them have got planets around. We also think that life may be a lot more common than we think. But we also think that most of that life probably isn't that intelligent and certainly not able to be able to contemplate their place in the cosmos, let alone this galaxy, our place in it. You know, and that's, that's what inspires me. But kids are so disconnected now. Everybody is disconnected from the night sky and it can teach us an awful lot. So, so being under a true dark sky really does change the way you think about not just, not just the universe or our galaxy, but really life itself. I, I think so. I mean, I'm not a religious person, but I find it incredibly spiritual here. Uh, and in those moments when I do get to not be looking at a monitor in the observatory, not be looking at the telescopes and fixing those, just that 15 or 20 minutes, just lying on the bonnet of the car, 
just gazing up and being able to take it all in. And it takes about 20 minutes for our eyes to kind of adapt to the darkness. And, and this really is representative of what I see when I'm here, this image. And when you do have that dark adaptation in your eyes, it, it really starts popping out. And that great rift, you know, that big dust cloud that we're seeing there, that is the thing that kind of starts looking three-dimensional. You don't see it as an area without stars. You kind of start feeling that it is this dense cloud of dust and gas. Well, I live in the state of Maine where our skies are very, very dark and people come here specifically for that reason. And mm. you're right, after about uh, 20, 25 minutes of gazing up into the, into the stars, that's when the show really begins. So, yeah. Paul, enjoy the show in the Canary Islands and thank you so much as always, my friend. Okay. And that about wraps it up for us here tonight. We hope you enjoyed all of our guests and our gorgeous live views of the Milky Way moving across the night sky. A special thank you to our feed partners, Alan Bursfeld in South Africa, Keith Cobby in Dubai, and of course to our network of all sky cameras around the world. And a big thanks to our guests tonight, Athena Brensberger, and Julie Fletcher, and Paul Cox. You can join in on keeping an eye on all things happening in space from meteor showers and comets to the sun, the moon, the planets, by making a reservation on our telescopes in the Canary Islands and Chile. Any paying member can reserve time on all our telescopes, looking live at stars and planets and galaxies and nebulae and all manner of celestial objects. On Tuesday, we'll be watching live as the famous Manhattan Henge lights up the streets of the Big Apple. That event starts at 8 p.m. Eastern time. And of course, we're constantly pointing our telescopes at the most interesting things in the night sky and streaming them live in the Situation Room. Tune in nearly every day for a different object or view accompanied by music and fascinating facts. That's all coming up here on SLU. So join the community, interact with other members, and tune in for all the fun. So thanks for stopping by. I'm Jerry Montour. You've been watching SLU, Space Forever.